Uh, kia ora koutou, ki te tangata e tu nei, tēnā koe, e te whanaunga o te moana nui a kiwa tēnā koutou. Uh, ki te manahere John McTurnan, e te kopapo te rā tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora everybody, um, well, it's, it's a huge uh, privilege to have John here. This is the beginning of a series of talks and workshops on effective advocacy and um, We've really got, uh, uh, we're incredibly lucky to have someone like John. There's no one better than him. He's an absolute global expert in effective advocacy, how you influence decision makers, uh, how you engage with the public. Um, for those of you who don't know John, and many of you do, um, he, he's a leading political strategist for BCW Global, which is, of course, the biggest communications uh, organisation in the world. Uh, but before that, he was the Director of Communications for the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, in Australia. And, of course, uh, Director of Political Operations for UK Labour, Scottish Labour. So um, a huge uh, uh, CV of effective advocacy and uh, something of royalty in the circles of, of um, political campaigning. Um, he's also a leading commentator on the BBC, CNN, ITV, basically all over the world, Al Jazeera. Um, and still advises governments across the world on um, policy, on effective advocacy, on public engagement and so on. So um, absolutely thrilled to have you, John. Uh, John was here a few years ago and we uh, set up some meetings for John and, and a group with uh, our Prime Minister and a bunch of ministers. And as soon as the bubble opens with the UK, John will be back. So, John, welcome to Aotearoa, New Zealand, and um, it's just fantastic to have you, and thank you for agreeing to do this. And well, we will have questions, everybody. Sorry, yeah, carry on, John. Thanks for inviting me, and I'm really, really sorry this is not in person, but I will be down as soon as I can be, um, and I'll hang around for as long as I'm tolerated. So, um, I want to say at the beginning of this, um, I really want to get a dialogue going during the meeting, um, ask me questions uh, in the chat function while I'm talking, use the Q&A session afterwards, and but also uh, be clear, I know this is different because we're, we're not, pr not together. Uh, if it was a conference, I'd be spending the morning with you, I'd be around, uh, I'd be at coffee, I'd be talking to people, you could come up and, you know, have a chat with me. Understand that you can ask me questions afterwards, things that occur during the day, things you reflect on, maybe the day after or whatever. Just come to me through uh, through Josie or the team um, and I'll get back to you. Um, and if when I'm around, I can be of use to you, don't hesitate to ask Josie to sort out connecting me with you because these things I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, are about relationships uh, and relationships are the biggest thing I've, I know from my career uh, over the decades I've been in politics are constantly refresh them, constantly invest in them, always be available for people, always listen to people. Because probably the first rule of impactful influence is don't make the first time you ever contact somebody the time you ask something of them. Have, some, have something in the bank already, some relationship, some connection, um you know the, the 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 best way they say in, they say in dc the best way to make somebody owe you something is do something for them for free like give something to somebody and then after that they're going to be much more obligated to you and because you're developing a relationship investing in it um i want to talk about a bit about who i am why i'm here josie's given me a nice introduction I've worked directly for half a dozen prime ministers. I still am working for uh, a Scandinavian prime minister advising uh, them on their electoral strategy. Um, I've written about a dozen political manifestos uh, across my career. So set out whole programs for government. And I've probably worked in 24, 25 countries uh, engaging with them. I've got longevity um, and when people, ask you what you gives what that gives you there's a story about teddy sharing the old the the old footballer he was 39 when he played for manchester united in the champions league final scored the two goals that won uh man U the the cup that made them the treble and 39 year old playing against 20 players in their 20s commentator once asked him what's it like being in your late 30s playing against all these young people and he went i've got 30 yards in my head 
because he'd played so often, done so much. He knew, he knew where the moves were going to go, where they're going to fall, and that's that's what I'd say. I've got I've got thirty years in my head, so I've done these things. The 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 one thing, and, and please do challenge me uh, if I fall into this. The one thing I never want to be is the money old guy in the corner who goes, we used to do it right in the past, you're not doing it right now. I want to be somebody who's seen it, done it, still wants to contribute, and is always willing to listen and to learn from you guys. Because really good questions, when they challenge me, I learn from them too. Um, and so that's that's what I want to do. I want to, I want to get into this and talk a bit about what's just happened um because we are because something really big has happened to us in 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 the last year um i i am a professional optimist uh i'm progressive from in my politics but i'm actually just one person who kind of is optimistic about life but last january is probably the first time in my life i thought something really big is happening in china and i really annoyed my family because I went, this is going to be really serious, and I got really worried, um, and I was re I was, uh, it disturbed uh, my adult son, his fiance, my partner, um, and the real problem about being right about COVID is I could never say I told you so. It really was big. This thing was, I could see it coming. Up. I, I was in government around um, around SARS. I knew the preparations we made, so I knew exactly what was going to grind into uh, grind into it. So something big has happened, but I think um, me think about what's happened. So there's a great line, uh, and I very rarely say this, but this is it's a great line of Lenin's, uh, where he says there are decades, there are decades in which nothing happens, and there are years in which decades happen, and it's really important that I think we've seen an acceleration, uh, compression and acceleration at the same time. So in the last year take the UK, take something not connected to our conversation. In the last year, there's been a gigantic shakeout on our high streets. Um, so retail, retail was gonna change over the next decade. That decade's worth of change has been compressed into, into a year. That's true of a lot of areas where, where things have been, home working, um, what we're doing now is Zoom. I, up until uh, the pandemic, I had a, a part of my year, so Ju June, July, I'd meet my American friends in DC at a conference. Um, summer, uh, proper summer, um, November, I'd be down in Australia. November, December, I'd be in Australia, New Zealand. Uh, and, and I realized looking back on it, I made my pattern of connections around when I traveled. Actually, I've had more connection with people in New Zealand and in, uh, in Australia regularly because of Zoom and because of the, vi the, the video conferencing we've been doing than I have. And so that's been a change. This, this, the, you know, we've always been thinking, when will VTC be used? When will, and actually it's happened. So it's become a new part of the way. So that's accelerated. But there's also that I, I think something about the 21st century is um, it's a paradoxical century because the same, there's another force going on, which is important to understand. There's that great quote by Lampedusa, the Italian novelist, um, reflecting a conservative ideology when he said, things must change if they are to stay the same. And one of the issues about uh, looking back over the last years, both those things are true. Massive changes have happened, but also things are gonna change, but they'll stay the same. So some of this, some of the underlying challenges that we have will still be there, whether it is uh, a thing that we share in, in, in London with, with, with you in New Zealand and with Australia, with Canada, house price inflation. There's some fundamentals that are not going away. So some, some, some things. And the way I sometimes say to clients about the, the 21st century, there's a, there's a, there's a quote by that great, um, baseball manager Yogi Berra who said what do you do when you when you when you come to a fork in the road pick it up you pick up the fork in the road because you don't take it you know don't choose to go one way or the other hold the tension hold that and that's the for me COVID uh, if I want to sum up what COVID's done for us Many people's discourse correctly is, we'll bounce back better, things will be better, we should be different, and we've been confronted with things. 
change takes a long time. Change takes decades to fully embed. And that's one of the things we can be impatient. You know, when I was a, a young man on the make, I was impatient for change. Now as a more, you know, an older, wiser person, I can see that decades, it takes decades to change things. You need the impatience, but you also need the, re the realism, the pragmatic realism. Um, what is COVID? Very many discourses around COVID treat COVID as a mirror, a mirror that reflects back to us. You listen to people and they're saying, COVID has just told me that what we actually need are more bike lanes. It's the policy I've always wanted. And now I'm saying COVID reveals that we need the thing I've all, COVID means we need UBI, universal basic income. Uh, an idea as mad now as it was 18 months ago, as it will be in 18 months time. But it's the, so COVID as a mirror is a very common part of our discourse. COVID as a lamp uh, is I think more important. COVID shone a sharp, bright light into the existing society, many things, many things which are wrong, not all of which will be rapidly resolved, but at least we've had this experience. So for me, that's the, the, the COVID experience has, has been, it's paradoxical, it's got change compressed, it's got something staying the same, a desire for change, and then, which is where I'm coming to, like, how do you achieve impactful uh, relationships? How do you actually impose your vision of how change should go and so i think like big picture what are we really seeing um government is back which is kind of obvious um but also because it's back in such a big way in every part of our lives it's kind of become normalized as well so you know we, we i'm talking to you uh with hair longer than it has ever been in my <laughs> life uh, because hairdressers have been closed since before Christmas and have just opened up. Um, in, in those kinds of things have just been accepted. Whole impositions on our way of being and our behavior. And I, right at the beginning of the COVID uh, pandemic, I, I did a, a piece of work with some chief executives, local government chief executives. And I said, think about British people. They just want to be told what to do. And all these chief executives said, no, we've got really difficult electorates, really difficult populations, really demanding uh, residents and tenants. And turns out we do want to be told what to do. It's been very interesting that the biggest, uh, the, the biggest worry that people had, uh, that there'd be COVID fatigue, rule fatigue, that people would just want to break down. That's not really come, come, to the, come to the fore. Government is back, government is everywhere. Government's not going away for a long time. That's a big picture thing and that's, that matters. Uh, for you, it matters for all of us, and it matters for all that what we're going to talk about. Centrism is back, um, which is which would have been hard to predict um, because Joe Biden uh, won the election, and because Georgia, the two Senate seats were won by the Democrats. A very muscular centrism is back with a very specific economic model in it, which I think is important to think about. What is the Biden economic model? And it's, it's, it's coming to New Zealand because it's the dominant economic model that's emerging. It is absolutely aggressively competitive in internationalizable innovation. So the tech giants and any form of innovation that the American state can produce internally. And bringing taxation home, you know, 21% or whatever, universally agreed level of corporation tax will be, it doesn't matter whether Ireland, in this example, whether Ireland sets corporation tax at 12%. If you're an American company and you're domiciled, uh, your European tax domicile is Ireland for the low corporation tax, Joe Biden's gonna tax you 9% on top of your profits to bring that money home to the US. And what's it gonna do? Inside the US, raise minimum wage, more money for care workers, investment in infrastructure, non, non jobs that can't be offshored are going to be protected and invested and spent on. That's a new economic model for the next 10, 20 years. And it's backed up with the firepower of the American treasury. So there's a new settlement coming up there. And that's part of the context into which all political conversations are happening. I'm saying, um, look, the Populism is going nowhere. Trump was defeated, but Trumpism has not been defeated. 
uh, and that's just a, that's just a round in politics. Um, Individualism is going nowhere either, which is really important. That um, uh, that driving demand that drives politics, populism and individualism compete and contest. Um, and China's going nowhere. And that's the, probably the biggest thing that the UK government has done in the last period that's not to do with COVID, with the publication of their integrated review of defense security position in the world, Britain in the world. And the foreign secretary said on the BBC, he said, China's going nowhere. China has to be, you've got to compete with China. You've got to collaborate with China. You've got to challenge China. Uh, you've got to question China. You, there's no single club available for dealing with China because you can't just deal with the countries as big as that. So what does, the, what does that take us to in terms of how do we make a lasting impact? And I think the, the test for lasting impact in, in dealing with, with um, the politicians, the diplomats, uh, the treaty bureaucrats, all of the people we have to deal with over, uh, over time is, The lasting change is, is the structural change. And the structural change doesn't need to be big. It can be small as long as it's lasting. It's the, you, know, you put a pebble in a stream and you can eventually divert the stream. Um, I've got a colleague who was chief of staff to Wayne Swan when he was treasurer in Australia. He was then placed by Australia to be their ambassador to the OECD. Uh, my colleague, Chris, uh, Chris Barrett, he looked around everything that the OECD were doing and he realized one thing that they didn't do was ever measure the economic cost of inequality. It was just not part of the, the framework, the economic analysis, the framework. And what he did was he took it as his task as the Australian ambassador to make one change. And his change was he made the case for putting an analysis of the cost of inequality into all the OECD did. Small change, big impact, because it's led to, you know, Chris has left, he's been, he's been replaced by the coalition government, but the change in the mindset, the change in the frame and the framing of the questions that are asked about, uh, about countries' economic development has in it that element. And we've always all known inequality has a cost. Um, and he's placed it in the framework. And so there's, so that ability to look and make an assessment, see what the structural change is and the change that's lasting. There's a, um, I once met a guy who invented air miles. Um, he got involved in the Olympics uh, organization in, in the UK. And I asked him like, what's your single piece of advice uh, for people going into business to try to understand how he thought about things as an entrepreneur. And he said, he said, the best thing to do is make money when you're sleeping. By which he meant, you know, he meant when he was asleep, air miles were being used and the copyright and like he, fees were coming back to him. But he also meant make a change that is embedded and lives and goes tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, keeps on moving and you don't have to keep your eye on it all the time. So you know that thing about leadership, um, the question, uh, what is a leader? So, you know, political leads are often lighthouse lead. They, they, they lead like lighthouses, which is they're scanning the horizon constantly. And when the beam of the leadership focuses on you, they look at you and they go, we need to sort this. Tony Blair, when he was doing Prime Minister's question, so question time, did it once a week. It meant that when you, when you took him, the list of questions he was going to have to answer, potentially, he went, okay, so that's the question. What are we doing? And pretty regularly, he'd go, I can't read that out because I don't agree with that policy. If that's what we're doing, I don't agree with it. So that kind of leadership of I scanning the horizon, but there's a leadership which is just like, you put a change in and it's constantly working and constantly working and five, 10, 15, 20 years later, it works. Similar, a similar example, you know, infrastructure is a very good example of it. Once you build a rail line, they tend to follow rail services. It's very hard. It's much easier to cancel a bus route than to cancel a train, a train line or take Central Park. Central Park was built out before New York reached Central Park. So Olmsted, when he laid out Central Park, 
knew that when Manhattan was big, it would need a park. So he took the land before the before the city got to it. So created a bit. So there's that kind of like claiming the land that you need. Now what what do I what what do I think about how the best way to deal with political political leaders, politicians, diplomats, treaty bureaucrats? There's some very simple things, and it's a again I don't I mean like, I don't often quote Lenin, I don't quote, often quote um, Ronald Reagan, but Reagan said a great thing once. Reagan said, um, it's not easy, but it is simple. So some of the rules of imp imp impact uh, on politicians are really simple. Um, respect them. And respect them because they're legislators, respect them because they have a voice in their party, respect them because they're ministers, Res respect politicians because they have, they're a minority, you know, in politics, there's not very many members of most political parties. So there's voters, smaller pool party members, a smaller pool within that is people who've ever got onto the candidates list, smaller pool, those who've even put themselves forward for, a, for, a, for an electorate, a parliamentary seat, a smaller number, so the top of the pyramid, the people who've been elected, however lowly a backbencher they are, they're, 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 they're one of a handful of New Zealanders who've ever been elected in the history of New Zealand. A handful of British people have ever been elected. So, you know, really do respect them um, because they have gone through this process. And because they are, they're in a workplace. Um, and in a workplace, there's a peer group and they all have influence on each other. Second thing is research. You can never under-research somebody when you, go to, when you go to see them, to talk to them, to meet with them and interact with them. Um, I would say about, about politicians, you should, before you ever meet a politician for the first time, go back and read their maiden speech. It's always really revealing what people say the first time they stand up and speak at the elected official um, or an appointed official, your maiden speech because you talk about yourself, you talk about your predecessor, you talk about your electorate, you talk about your in, the causes that you have. Um, and those things run right through people. It's, it's, again, we are, you know, we're very lucky people. We get to, um, we get to, I, I, I'm a very lucky person. I get to travel and interact with far more people in far more contexts and far more cultures and far more, far more areas. Than, than my parents did, and definitely my grandparents did. You know, my gr my granddad was a was a shipwright uh, in Govan in Scotland, and my granny was a cleaner. Um, so so the the exposure that 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 I've had, but research, 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 find out about people because however many different experiences people have, there's a core of interest they've always had. Then that, you know there are things that there are things that motivate them. Understanding what motivates them. Uh, is a really important way, and there's always, you know, we, we again, we know. One thing I often say to, to people who, who operate in political contexts when they go, "Why doesn't this work?" and it's like, quite often we, if we want to have people come around to our house for a dinner party, we don't email them, and then hope they get back to us. Um, we actually follow up. We speak to them for yeah. You know, we actually invest in a relationship because we, so we're trying to we're trying to persuade people to do something. Um, so we need to invest in that relationship, and the best way to, to 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 do that is to understand their interest and find a way we can align our interests with their interests. Which is my next point: understand. So un, an understanding is understand people's drivers, understand their incentives understand their constraints because we're constrained by the mandates of our organizations we're constrained by the scale of the change we think is possible we're constrained by the coalitions that we build and therefore we that we settle on some demands or other demands the people we want to impact on have their constraints too so you so you have to try to find the to find the thing that works. I I got to know um, um, I got to I, I, I got to know Bono uh, a, 
a, a bit through when I was uh, working in the Labour Party. And the stuff done around aid. I got, I got this amazing phone call once. Um, I was out of the office, came back into the office, and everybody was staring at me. I was working at the Scottish Labour Party at the time. And I, and I went, why are you looking at me? And they said, Bob Geldof just, just phoned to speak to you. And I went, OK. I phoned, I phoned Bob back. Uh, and Bob went, John, I'm, on a, I'm, I'm in a canal boat on a canal in Germany with Bono. And we want to um, get a photo op at the G7 meeting in Cologne. And I went, no problem, mate. Um, and I phoned Jonathan Powell in Tony's office. Uh, and within 24 hours, Bono and Geldof were doing a, a, a debt eradication photo op with the leaves of the G7. Now, that's because they all had interest, they were all had interests uh, in alignment there. Um, Bono, who I once asked, like, is what do you get your most criticism for? And he said, well, for having um, for going to prayer breakfasts with President Bush, President George W. Bush. And I went, what do you mean? Well, people attack me for going into a prayer meeting with evangelical Christians and George W. Bush. And so I said, well, what do you, what's your answer to that? And he said, well, one simple transactional, which is I got $25 million uh, for anti malaria nets. Um, for sub-Saharan Africa. But the real thing I say to people is my attitude towards President Bush and to evangelical Christians is I find what we agree with, what we have in common, and work on using that. I don't find what we conflict about and fight about and fight about it and feel satisfied with myself and make no progress on it. And that's a re that's a that you know that and that feeds into my my kind of final uh, thing, which is what should you be doing? Always have something to offer, which I think feeds back a bit to what I said at the very top of this, when I said, don't be always going to, you know, don't make the first time you pick up the phone, the time you have to ask something for somebody. Always be giving something extra. It's one of the, it's one of the, you know, always leave something extra behind. Something is not expected, give something extra, give something. And there always is something. And it, it could be as simple as an insight. It could be some infer information, it could be some intelligence, it could be a pre-warning. Uh, it could be, um, again, I always used to say this to NGOs in London, um, if you're within um, half an hour's drive of Westminster, you're in a better position to get a photo opportunity with a minister than almost anybody, because they always want a backdrop for an announcement so you can, if you make it clear that you're always, you're, you know, Harriet Harman was my boss for, 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 for ages. And Harriet is a long-term feminist, uh, long-term campaigner for childcare in, in the UK. And she, for the whole of the Labour government, uh, it was known uh, by Tony and then by Gordon Brown, his prime minister, that you would get, if you want to make an announcement about preschool, about um, childcare, about under fives, any, she had a nursery she could make available for you that was professional, photogenic, and available. And those relationships, you know, that nursery was looked after too. So make, making yourself available in, in whatever way for the things that they want, because if you're available for the things that they want, they'll be available for some of the things that you want. And the don'ts um, are really, they're obvious, but they're really, really, really important. Um, because a relationship isn't a transaction, a relationship, you know, it's uh, a relationship is for life if it's done properly. Um, it's like, again, with politicians, I always say, never be disrespectful for a very, to a very junior correspondent who wants a quote from you for something, because they may be a stringer for a local paper, but they may end up as the political editor of the most important TV channel. Because that's, because we, it, it tends to be that we professionally live in a world in which the same people come round. They have, occupy different positions, sometimes in an NGO, sometimes in the government department, sometimes in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in an international body. So that kind of, and you don't have to be friends, but you do have to be respectful. So like, don't demand. People are really off put by being demanded uh, from a dozen. Don't disrespect. 
don't disregard because because what is coming back from to you needs to be considered and responded to one of the, one of the great things tricks i've learned um i've brought it back into politics the one the, the greatest things I, i've learned from diplomats is that by and large diplomats never say no they kind of always go i've probably not expressed myself clearly enough and it's a very clever move because what you because what you're doing is you put in you're saying it's not your fault that we've not come to an agreement it's my fault for not being clear enough shall we just keep talking and when you see the the big disasters in in international diplomacy and i think copenhagen was one of them um the biggest underlying disaster at copenhagen was they didn't book the conference center for an extra few days they booked it for the period of the summit and I, everybody I know who's done international cemetery goes, that's a schoolboy error. Nothing ever runs to time. You always need to have the extra day. And that in diplomacy, time is quite elastic. The Good Friday Agreement and uh, the, the, you know, the historic peace deal between uh, the UK government and um, the Parsing conflict in Northern Ireland, the Good Friday Agreement was signed on Easter Monday. It's because it, because Tony was absolutely clear. This has to be done today on Easter Friday. That is the deadline. We're all together going to finish on Easter Friday. And by midnight on Easter Friday, they all agreed that it was going to be Easter Friday until they got the agreement. And so the Good Friday agreement was done on Easter Monday. But they all so the elasticity is a creativity. It's like we're not going to come to a stop. And that's important, you know. This is a di this is dialogue. It's a relationship. The talking has to keep on going. Um, don't delay. So, if the people you're interacting with ask for information, ask for briefing, want that, don't, don't be slow in getting back to them, and don't. And I think this is probably the most important thing for me. And it goes back to what I said before, which is you're going to be in this world for quite some time with each other. Don't drop somebody once they've given you the thing you wanted. Um, because there's going to be other things you want in the future. And if you're the person who just drops them as soon as then you've made it clear, you know, like I know I now know what we've got. We don't have a we don't have uh we don't have um a relationship. And what I was going to finish on was the way that I think we need to approach articulating uh, what we want. And it's what I said at the very beginning, edge crunch and lift. I, I'm kind of relentless in saying the good policy, good campaigns, good speeches, good interventions have edge crunch and lift. And by, by which I mean, you need edge to cut through that we're all busy people. We've all got too many un unopened emails in our inboxes. We've got too many demands on us. We've got too many things that we that we need to be doing. That not only are we busy in our professional lives, we're busy in the other bits of our life. That if you're if you if you know your phone is full of social media demanding your attention, full of distractions. So you need to cut through what's you know there. The average person sees thousands of adverts, or to be more accurate, the average person has thousands of adverts targeted at them during a day. And by and large, you'd go mad if you actually paid attention to them all. So what we do is screen them all out. We even, we're even used to screening out the branding. Almost everything that we have, you look around uh, the room you're in, there's branding, there's branding on your phone. If it's it, whoever made the phone, there's branding on t-shirts. Bra branding is everywhere. We screen it out. You need edge to cut through people's ability to screen things out. Crunch, uh, crunch is in, in um, the UK used to have a music program called the Old Grey Whistle Test. And that was based on uh, a saying in Tin Pan Alley, which was the music industry, songwriting industry uh, focus in, um, in London like London's Brill building, it's like where the songs were written. And the saying was, that if you wrote a really good tune, a really hooky tune, uh, the test of it was to go to um, 
one of the concierge is one of the um uh, the, the door staff at a theater or a, a cinema and and if you could play them the tune and they could whistle it back to you it passed the old gray whistle test the old old gray bearded guy could remember it and by crunch i mean if you have a demand a desire a story a request if you express it in a crunchy way the person you say it to can repeat it to somebody else who can then repeat it to somebody else. It's memorable because it's crisp. It's memorable because it is well expressed. If it's badly expressed, then you get Chinese whispers and you get the distortion of the message. So it's that it's got edge cut through, it's got crunch, it's got like, it's got that kind of granularity. Um, and the final thing and the most important thing, uh, and I'll close on this and we can move on to question, but is what I, what I call lift. And that's the most important thing because we do these jobs, not, you know, we don't, we don't work to live, we live to work. Why do we live to work? Because these jobs inspire us. The things that we do are inspirational. The visions that we have are transform, transformational. And if you can't express that in a way that gives people a sense of uplift, a sense of aspiration, a sense of lifting your eyes to the mountains, um, then really you should find some other job to do. Because if we are not inspired by the things we're working for, we really can't hope that the people we're trying to impact on uh, are in any way uh, inspired by them. And I. I, you know, in my speech writing classes, I go, the first test of a great speech is if you as a speech writer are interested in what you've just written. Because if you're interested in it, when your boss reads it, there's a chance they're interested. And if your boss is interested in it, there's a chance the audience is interested in it. So edge, crunch and lift, because the stuff we do is really, really important. That's why I'm here, because it's so important that we have to find the way, you know, you've got to thread the needle, you've got to get through the small opportunity, you've got to take the moment when we get the moment. Um, and so now it's, it's over to you, there's going to be some, there's going to be some questions. Um, and as chair, I've got no doubt that Josie will, uh, will uh, use her position as chair to ask some penetrating <laughs> questions. I can see some, see some running up uh, in the, in the chat already. And one of them is one of the big ones, but um but questions on what i've just said questions on what's at the top of your mind what's keeping you awake at night what's the stone in your shoe um fire away brilliant john thank you um I, I, this question is coming through i'm just going to start with one because i know that we um sent you a few very brief examples of some of the campaigns and advocacy um issues that the sector has been running on i wondered if you apply the edge crunch lift framework um and just just so you everybody knows we actually translated edge crunch lift into mm -hmm. maori gave it to john when he came to new zealand but um uh, mm -hmm. how would you apply edge crunch lift to say uh, there's the modern slavery uh campaign for legislation for modern slavery to prevent modern slavery there's the big hearts campaign calling for increase in aid cancellation of debt so on uh, there's obviously advocacy around increased funding for Rohingya, uh, for for um, uh, famine in Yemen. How would you apply that edge crunch lift to some of those? You don't have to do it all of them, but some of those examples that um, that we sent you. So the, 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 that's a great question. So I, look, I think what. There's a really difficult path to tread, I think, on some of the some of the most challenging problems, because there is. You have to have some way of making people realize. This thing still happens like so modern slavery. I remember um, in the in the 1980s when an American uh, academic friend of mine said he was stopping teaching and what he was going to do was uh, go to work for one of the oldest and longest established anti-slavery organizations um based in london and i kind of went yeah but why 
you know, slavery is slavery is 19th century issue. And then he told me, and it's like, so there's some problems. You have to find a way to tell people this thing really exists and find a way to get through to that. While at the same time, uh, st stopping it being that problem so big, I can do nothing. Um, the paralysis of like, what can I do? The, you know, the great story about Gandhi, um, why did, why, why did Gandhi say, let's go to the sea and make salt? He said, let's go to the sea and make salt because the British Empire had a salt tax. He said, let's go to the sea and make salt because we could all walk to the sea. And he said, let's go to the sea and make salt because we can all make a salt pan in the sand. So when the tide goes out, the water's trapped and then it dries out and you've got salt. So he had a leadership demand into which a lot of people could put themselves and put their place. Similar when JFK said, um, uh, I want to, and he did say, I want to put a man on the, on, on the moon in 10 years now. Um, he did allow, you know, people could choose their role in that. If you're a woman, you couldn't be on the moon, but you could be a computer. You could be one of the people doing the calculations. You, people could, with a big task like that, you can find your role in it. Um, and so it is, it's important to find a way to cut through, but to give people the space for the role that they can find in themselves. I think a thing that I think is a really hard test to do um, is to sort out the demands you're making, which make you feel good, but don't make the world better. And that's a re and that's it's which ties back to the you know if there's a role in it for me and I can do something, then I'm not disempowered. I'm, given, I'm being given agency. Um, the the, the making the de, it's the the making the demand that you know can't be met because of ideology or because of budget or because of the individual but the point is it's a bit it's a bit it's it, it is the satisfaction of being denied a demand and that's not the purpose the the, the purpose is not the process the purpose is the outcome so it's how do we get the how do we achieve the outcome? Which um, so those are those are kind of my uh, some some of my, some of my tests. Um, John Charlotte's asked a really um, difficult question. So how do you advocate with and yeah. Charlotte, feel free to turn your mic on. How do you advocate to politicians that you're in opposition? So you're actually campaigning uh, for something that they're doing or not doing. How yeah. do you do that? And how do you do it? How do you advocate for something that's unpopular with the public? Mm. Feel free to talk, that's, Charlotte. If you want. I was just gonna, um, you, yeah, we can hear you. Put your mic down. Yeah, there we go. Not used to this still. Um, I guess I, the, the question is really like, um, you know, for an organisation like Save the Children, we get a lot of our funding from MFAT, um, so directly from the government. Um, and, you know, I think it, we feel that that does constrain us a little bit in um, mm -hmm. what we can say. Um, so how do you kind of get around that? Um, and then I guess the other thing is then, yeah, if, if you're advocating for something that might not be popular um, with the public, um, how do you do that without getting kind of blowback on that, um, without getting um, retaliation for that? Um, that's really good. That's really good. Look, so the, the, the answers to those questions are interlinked and the first thing is there's nothing that a politician is more scared of than a voter. Uh, and they don't even have to be an, a representative voter. They don't even need to be a majority of people. It's just real people making real demands that scare politicians immensely. Uh, I was once, um, a, a delegation of eight people came from an estate of two and a half thousand people and stop and reverse the decision in, in my council um, that I was a councillor on, which would have involved selling a piece of land that wasn't even connected to the estate and would have given us 20 million pounds to, to modernise the park that the estate faced onto. But the eight people who didn't want change were real people in front of councillors. Every person is a real voter who really meets somebody. And anybody who's worked in politics or around politicians knows 
the heart sink of when they come they come back into the office after on after being in the constituency for for a weekend when they start telling you a string of anecdotes about who they met and what they said to them so the real people real faces real voices have a massive impact and that's uh, and the thing is it's hard to get real people with real voices to say real things and it's easier for us as professionals to say the things we want to say that's why they have the, the scarcity value of real people saying real things real impact those voices authentic stories really has a huge impact that's that's like that's one of the sides which is the is that as as long as you're aligned with the public it makes it a lot you know essentially it's harder for people for the government to come at you if they've got to come through the public first to get to you now that ties to what you said about um what if it's not popular now the thing about politicians the other they are part i mean they're part they've got these things fighting within them paradoxically people the cliche that's not true about politicians is that politicians are all short-termist but actually none of the politicians i've ever worked with uh labor or tory liberal or conservative national or labor, they're not short-termist um they actually have an almost boundless capacity um to believe that they can shape make decisive things long into the future um and that's a strand you have to play with them in because they know like you know they know like as we do that some opinions uh some of the opinions that we hold some things we want we are kind of prematurely correct in five or ten years time the public will catch up with us we're not advocating for things which are wrong we're advocating for things which there's some resistance to them and there was maybe no knowledge about them politicians are quite happy to be early adopters too because early adopters are innovate you know early adopters innovators policy leaders um and so you have to play you have to be able to play in both those spaces now that's not easy but it is possible um because at the heart of it you know what the the saying is, is true the good good policy is good politics it might be that the reason it's not adopted is not good policy and it might be that what you need strategic patience you might actually need to advocate for something for a long time before it comes to fruition there are some changes that take what the um, uh, what the Brookings Institute calls policy persistence. Some things do take a decade or more than that to change. But the thing is, if you're around or your organization's around at the time when the politicians want to change this thing, if you've been advocating for this and you've found ways to present it and represent it, when they reach for the policy solution for this policy problem, you are front of mind you're the go-to people oh yeah we should go and talk to save the children um therefore they've got some stuff on this on uh, they've got some stuff on this i know that and they've they, so you so yeah it's the um isn't it is what arnold arnold palmer uh was once asked why he was so lucky and he said practice um you have to practice and practice and practice and then sometimes you'll get your moment and then if you are there, you know, be present and connected. Um, John, a question from Kate. Kate, do you want to uh, speak to it? But the premise of it is, how do you encourage a government that is a little bit risk averse to be mm. more, transformation, more transformational? Um, and Kate, do you want to talk to that question? Or? And actually, I was going to add something onto that, John, before Kate yeah. talks if she wants to. But um, what is the role, uh, another question that's come through, what is the role of protest? You know, what is the role of petition, building, you know, yeah. go, going out, yeah. getting petitions and so on? So, Kate, do you want to chat to yours or talk to yours or? Yeah, sure, just very briefly. Um, I guess the landscape here um, is that, so we've got a brand new independent climate commission, which has advised the government on steps to take um, to yeah. do our bit on climate change. We've got school strikes which are you know they were growing in momentum before COVID and hopefully we'll see a comeback but yeah really interested in what um 
your read on the situation is about what what tactics yeah. um, in and around the school strikes would be useful to move the government to adopt the um, recommendations. Um, that's a good, good the, the school strikes question is really interesting because I um, I went to I went I've been doing some work in Sweden and I was going to a meeting in the parliament and I went past a bit where the school strike um, the pickets are and I said oh that's that's um, that's interesting um, and the people I were with were going uh, Greta Thunberg is really unpopular um, in Sweden and I'm going well she's really well known outside and they went no Swedish people think education is really really important it's the most important thing in life it's the most transformative transformative thing it's the foundation of social democratic welfare state um, so most people think the idea of a school strike is the most appalling idea that anybody could ever have so it's, it's quite interesting that in the that in the country where it originated it's really really unpopular which which, which goes to a quite you know the quite powerful observation that you know they they the culture quite often sits upstream of politics um, and that that, um, that you can't take a political battle uh, against your culture. You can shape the culture to shape the politics, but you can't really shape the politics to shape the culture. Um, the, the, what is interesting about climate change is, so in Britain, and I don't know what the situation is in, in, in New Zealand, I've not looked at the manifestos. In 2017, no party in Britain, including the Greens, stood on a programme of net zero. In 2019, 96% of voters voted for parties which had net zero in their party manifestos. That is one of the biggest changes in, in, in political policy in Britain and where's that come from? It came from the elites. It didn't come from. It didn't come from the bottom up. It didn't. No, some of it will have come uh, via Greta. Some will have come via the, you know, Extinction Rebellion. Some of it will come by um, the blooming truth. If you if you look around, something's going on. Um, and I always think about political leaders. I say this to people. So to, 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 to political leaders. The public are really ungrateful. They never thank you for what you just done for them. Um, but they also are correctly demanding, which is that by the time something feels to be a, an issue that's so pressing that they feel they have to make politicians deal with it, they're really angry because it's like, we voted for you to be politicians because you said your job was to do the long-term thinking. And we've actually seen such a big thing come into us, we've had to tell you it's a problem. Like, come on, give us a break. I don't want to do politics. That's your job. You've chosen that. I don't want to be in your lane. You're in your lane. Um, so I, the climate change thing, to be honest, um, New Zealand is going to have to do what President Xi wants New Zealand to do. Because Xi and Biden and the European Union are all aligned which means that COP26 in Glasgow um, will lead to a major, will lead to a, a major global uh, compact. And the New Zealand government have no choice but to be part of that. Um, I don't think there's, I'm not sure there's a political uh, constituency in New Zealand because you're not Australia. There's not a political constituency for not being part of COP26, for not being part of Glasgow, the Glasgow um, communique and things. Um, it's 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 a it's a it's a it's a it's a very good question, and it goes to the heart of that there are there are elite, there are policy elites, people who care about policy who talk about it, and there's the general public, and that a lot of progress can be made, uh, jerkily sometimes and slowly and then fast. Is that you know that thing that um is that is it a hit is in um Fitzgerald, Fitzgerald um. Um, but no, the, the first job one, which is how, how do you go bankrupt very, very slowly and then very quickly? Um, that's how policy changes. Policy changes very, very slowly, then very quickly. Uh, and I think you, it goes back to my thing. If you have the right analysis and you have the right policy prescriptions and you're around 
when the people when when the leadership whether it's the bureaucratic leadership or the political leadership need to reach for a solution and you're on the fr in the front of their mind because you've actually been around and been being helpful you can contribute to that um and the and the climate and the climate change one is a negotiation isn't it because um it's it's the largest it's the big it's the biggest scale behavior change that we're ever going to ask anybody to go through and it's in quite a compressed period and problematically uh the politicians don't have an eco economic model that allows them to answer the question where's the cost fall um and so helping with the difficult because because being an expert in the area you can see the full landscape try and sort the full landscape and then find the way that there's a menu of options that the people that, that can be picked up on um so it's like it's and i suppose the final thing i'd say is the public are always moving and so the you know the um here's was some um, dennis healy the who's a labor chancellor in the 70s so being chancellor of the exchequer or being treasurer being chancellor of the exchequer uh is like driving 110 miles an hour uh down a motorway only having the rear view mirror to look into because you're looking at what the stats were about what the economy has been not what the economy is going to be the same thing is true of um opinion polls i'm a pollster by trade in in, my, in a past life is opinion polling this goes to the heart of all we're talking about is opinion poll our opinion polls a horse race so the snapshot tells you how it is like this is the winner that's the loser that's second place or are they uh some kind of dashboard that allows you to say what's moving what's going and that you can dig into and find okay um this is where people are at the moment, but the complexity of it is these things. These things are movable, and these ways of talking about things move you from, from here to there. So if you look at the number of things, for example, in America that Joe Biden calls infrastructure, he calls them infrastructure, not because they are infrastructure, but because there's a public appetite for investment in infrastructure that's not there for spending just as the public appetite for investment, not public spending. So there, there are ways to talk. If, you, if you've ever done any focus groups with people, if you ever attended any focus groups, what is really interesting is that people have very, very strong opinions held on quite shallow basis, and that you can find different ways to make an argument that help are easier for people to walk towards you. And I, I always think that um, you should never make one doorway through which people have to come to agree with you um build loads of bridges and let's see how people come across different bridges and i think for the complicated challenges the ones which can be unpopular or challenging and to circle back to to to, to, to protest look um the one thing i broke lockdown to do in in um earlier in in, in 2020 was i went to the black lives matter demonstration um i went because my because uh, my son and his fiance were going to go to it I knew they were going to go to it. I didn't want them to think that, that, that they were worried about going to it and then coming back and bringing COVID back to the house. And so me and my partner, we just said, we're going to come with you. So the four of us went to Black Lives Matter. It was a really important, it was a really important thing to, to be to be witnessing, to, to actually to be on the streets at that moment. Um, similarly, I went to the band demonstration. We all went to the band demonstration uh, on Clapham Common for um the woman who was was uh, allegedly murdered by a metropolitan police officer uh didn't wasn't there for we weren't there for the, the police crackdown but we were there for um so that there are times when you know demonstrations are moments that express something deep and profound about a society and they they are a, they're a form of political change but it's like the other stuff i've been saying it's the the BLM demonstrators didn't have an agenda. Somebody, an NGO has to have an agenda or a coalition of NGOs or a political party. Or, so like being, being the person who's there with a plan 
at the right moment is really important. And so always being prepared to have the plan and always being present and always being available and always finding ways to renew and refresh it for yourselves. Because again, it goes back to, if you're bored with it, there's no chance the politicians uh, will be interested in it. If you're interested, in it, um, then there's a chance that, they'll, that, that they will be interested in it. Um, John, we're just we're coming up to the hour. So we've yep. got, um, for those who just want to stay around, if, you, if you're okay to stay for another um, 10 minutes, we've got two more questions which have come yep. up and then we'll we'll close it off then. Um, mm. So Molly, Molly's mentioned, I'll get Molly to talk to it, but in essence, Molly, really shortly, it's what you're asking is in terms of trade and commerce, yep. fair trade, um, and, and using those tools to reduce inequality, how do you mm. get cut through with something that's so complicated? Molly, if you want to... Well, only that very often um, the, the issues that we're facing are yeah. structural. They're, they're, you know, they're complex and, yeah. and having conversations, modern slavery has really simplified a lot of stuff for trade. Um, yeah. and, and that's been uh, important uh, and a really big shift and a fantastic one actually for the conversation. But I'm just, I'm just interested in, in, I mean, the point you made about OECD, I absolutely loved because taking something as simple as equality and then just getting the data or the information around it mm. and change the conversation. But I guess I'm interested in your thoughts on, on you know, for something as structural as engineering for fair in a world, uh, when you're thinking about things like trade and commerce, it, it, what, any ideas, mm. I'd love them. <laughs> and Thanks, Molly. <laughs> yeah, no, no, but no pressure, John. And then no I, I'll come to pull right. to the final question. Yeah, look, the... Thinking is really hard. Um, good ideas are really hard. One of the, you know, one of the lessons uh, that I think we've all learned through our careers is very few things are done by one heroic individual. They're done by teams. Great things are done by great teams. And I, for one, um, always have my best ideas in collaboration with other people in conversation and discussion and some you know and it's you know the um, the hegel um the hegel uh line where hegel said the owl of minerva flies always at dusk you know by which he means the the owl of minerva the, the, the symbol of wisdom uh always comes at the last moment like how many meetings have you ever been in where the best idea is the one in the 59th minute? There is no one minute meeting. The, the 58 minutes created the moment for the one minute. And so one of the things about some things have been around and we worked on the solutions and we worked on the toolkits, we worked on the, you know, it, it, the work on language, the work on framing, the work on, these are hard things to do. And that's why we try to get together like this, so that we can learn from each other, and we can, uh, we can, we can, we can find ways to, to 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 think through this. And it's like you know, fair trade was a was a great way of talking about something. Now it it was, but it was. It's like with everything that makes progress. It's not an endpoint. It's a staging post. And one of our difficulties is that is that sometimes we institutionally ourselves. Um, we push for something, it gets established, and then we settle to defend it. And we didn't build it to defend it. We got it there so we could go to the next step and the next step and the next step. And one thing, and it, it, it goes back, for me, it ties back a bit to why did I go to BLM, you know, partly because of my son and his, his, his partner. Partly because I always want to go to where the energy is because there's always going to be something where the energy is. And if you look at fair trade, for example, I, I, the, way the, the way it's expressing itself in the UK parliament at the moment, for example, is you've got labor and conservative backbenchers all being concerned about the countries we do trade deals with. Everybody concerned with um, the supply chain and so there was a parliamentary inquiry into the in cotton from the XUAR, and what clothes it was used in, and what's what was the forced labour in the supply chain, 
for Nike or for um, North Face or for other, uh, for other clothes brands. And what is interesting about that is um, you dig deep into it. Cotton's fungible. You can't tell where cotton's grown. Cotton, cotton, cotton grown in the XUAR and cotton grown in India. They're traded on international um, trading platforms. So it's very, but by diving deeper and deeper and deeper into it, you get to a place. Because I was interested in the kind of the ethics coming through, you start to think about that. So what's actually going on there? What you've actually got is a combination of things going on. So Nike first came under pressure because of an investigative journalist in the 90s going, to, going I know what's going in in some of your factories in the Far East. Then you get the ILO. Then you get Nike and other manufacturers going, all right, we're not, we'll all going to adopt the ILO conventions because we don't want to compete in that way with each other. Now, would they have done that without the journalist? No. Without the ILO? No. Also, would they have done it without um, the pressure of consumers? Because if you're a cool brand, it's basically not cool to have forced labor. Now, that's a crass thing to say, but people who want to buy cool things don't want to buy them from organizations doing uncool things. And that there's a nexus out there of leading edge consumers who are also quite often the values of the leading edge consumers which drive future market share and innovators and disruptors. They're also quite often the values of the most in demand staff. So that actually one thing I know about, about um, Facebook is after the disinformation, after the Trump campaign, um, Facebook found it harder to recruit in the Bay Area than other because people basically thought the brand was uncool. Because like uncool things have been done with Facebook, like electing Trump. And so there's a dynamic out there, which certainly me, I'm not saying any of you, but certainly me, now I'm in my 60s, I have to listen to people out there. You have to find places and spaces to go and find things. But also, you have to be a bit blunt as well, which is, um, because I looked at the, XU, the XUAR and cotton and the clothing, I thought, what else has gone in supply chains? You dig around for about 10 minutes and you realize the biggest supply chain scandal um, affecting Europe is probably chocolate. You know, a million and a half child workers in the cocoa bean supply chain. Why is, and every five years, the European Union says it will do something in the next five years and they never do. And why is that? And it probably is because of big chocolate. Definitely. You know, chocolate's so important to Belgium, the defensive power around that, so that one country for whom it's a big industry can can lift can can just slow things down. And and it is the so, so yeah, so I've been you know, I've been thinking one opportunity Britain has by being outside the European Union is and not. Britain could be the country that goes, we're going to say our country takes this action on the supply chain of child labor in, 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 in the chocolate industry. And so you, you, that is me thinking, Britain's outside the European Union, what does that mean? Well, one country can move more nimbly than 27. Same, with, same is true of New Zealand. One country can move more nimbly than a group of countries have to agree. So you, so you've, and then you go, okay, that's interesting. What's going on? You've got a government for whom Brexit has to be a success, but they've got a brand, Global Britain. Now, Global Britain could be a purely conservative notion of the world, but Britain's 60 plus million people. You can't let Global or Britain be defined by a tiny number of conservative people. So you go, okay, let's color this in. What if I said Global Britain, and it's the conversation going in the House of Commons, should be a country where our supply chains don't have child labor in them. Now, you, you actually have got to a point where conservative politicians don't go, I don't see what's wrong with child labor. So we've actually eliminated that being rhetorically possible. We've not made, we've not, but we've not eliminated being actually possible. So it's, it's the, we have to be strategic, tactical, nimble, and 
finding the can't go back to the bon the bono point find the common cause with the broadest number of people now how do you how do you get cut through i think so for me i've done i said i'm polling Every conversation, the reason why I never, I, I don't actually in the end get annoyed with politicians coming back from their constituencies and saying, my neighbor was saying this, or I heard this at the summer phase, or I heard that. Every conversation is a focus group of one or a focus group of two or three, if done properly. You know the thing they say about conversation, which is conversation isn't simply waiting for your turn to speak. If you do conversation in a way that actually you listen and, you know, two ears, one mouth, you should be listening twice as much as you're talking. If you do that, there's gold, there's gold everywhere. And our danger is we've gone through the whole cycle. We've seen there's a problem. We've seen these, the elements of it. We've seen these, the possible articulatable solutions. We've seen some of these uh, are better uh, financially, better in values terms, and we've decided this is the solution. We've gone through a part of the process to get to our, the public we're interacting with is still here. And we're going to sign up to our solution. And they want to go through the process too of, ah, it's a problem. What are the ways we could deal with it? What are my values? What's, what would be most, and we need a bit of strategic patience to press and press and press on our policy priorities and a bit of humility to not think like we're right, but not to think that the other people that we're trying to convince are stupid. They're, they've got to make a journey too. And well, they should make the journey too, because if people don't make the journey with you, in the end, you've not shifted the majority opinion. You've just shifted elite opinion. And go back to Brexit, elite opinion in the UK was always convinced that being part of the European Union was a solution for Britain. The public weren't. And the consequence is, in a world where the public can have their say, they won't bow to elite opinion. And like the, the greatest, the two great, the greatest things of the last century were adding 30 years to the average life, which is amazing, never happened in any century before, um, and the death of deference. And if you're an elected official, as I was, and if you're a political advisor, as I was, and if you're a prime minister, as I wasn't, it's really annoying that there's no deference anymore. Why wouldn't they just do what I say? But it's the country we want to create. It's the world we want to create where there wasn't that deference, which means there's the negotiation. And so uh, I know that's a long-winded answer, but I can't, there's, there's, there's a lot of work. It's important work and we have to do it well and it will take us time. But, but the big thing, I go back to what I said right at the beginning, if there's a future that's the right one, there are moments when you can accelerate it and you have to be ready to pull up that pull up future forward and like speed, speed, speed through, speed through time. And that's and those moments when they come are they're, they're just gold. Like the when when Tony and Tony Tony Blair and Gordon Brown just abolished the debt for heavily indebted nations at the Glen Eagles uh summit. And and there's this funny thing which it, it's it's when the when the labor the, in 1929 the labor government in in the uk was on the gold standard and they they hit the depression they're still on the gold standard in 1931 the coalition government was created they, they came off the gold standard and philip snowden the labor chancellor exchequer said no one said we could do that and the thing was they didn't have a battery a range of options being presented to them they just can't find you had to, there's a, there was another question wasn't there a last question yeah oh, last question from um pauling you still there, Pauline? Yeah, it's more an observation um, yeah. because I think one of the things that's different about New Zealand and the UK is our access to politicians. Yeah. For example, yesterday I had a very good meeting with the Minister of Police um, mm -hmm. and on Friday I met with the former Minister of Conservation and this is all part of the Big Hearts campaign We've met the minister, Kate Day, who was on before and has just left um, for Angler for Movement, have met most of the Labour politicians and Green politicians in the Wellington area. Um, so we do have easy access to our politicians. Mm -hmm. 
it's not difficult to get an appointment with them. I agree with you, John, you have to build up a relationship. Okay. And that that um, is true, particularly if they get elevated to being ministers. Oh. Um, but we do, and I don't think we use it enough. And if anything, this campaign has taught us uh -huh. is the need to keep actually in front of politicians, either yeah. of our backbenchers or cabinet ministers um, with the issues, because what we have found uh -huh. is a great deal of ignorance about our overseas development assistance program. So it's been an educational um, uh, process for them. Uh, and also we, we suspect, we're not too sure, but we, we have been told that within the budget, which will be on the 20th of May, there will be an increase on climate change financing, which is one of the asks for the campaign. But that's just my observation. Um, in New Zealand, access to MPs, it's, it's, it's a lot easier than I know than many other countries, and my feeling is we don't use it enough. Look, that's that's a that 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 that's a really good point, and it's true of a small polity like Scotland as well, where where I worked for a period, um, and where my family, most of my family, still are, my mum and my brothers and sisters. I would say the when I when I look back on being a councillor uh, in London versus Southwark, people say, "What was it like? What did you do over the eight years?" I will take you. Uh, and I'll show you the Tate, uh, Tate Modern, because I, I gave a million pounds um, to the Tate Gallery to do a feasibility study on turning a power station into, um, into a gallery. I'll take you around my neighbourhood. I'll show you this, the, the primary school I got relocated from two, uh, to, from, a, from a church hall and an 1848 uh, school building on both sides of a, a busy road, and I got them relocated into a into a new school. I'll show you the, um, I'll take, basically I'll take you and show you things that I did and I did with the community. If you ask me what I spent eight years doing, I spent eight years in meetings. I did all my time was spent in meetings. No councillor, no politician ever says, looks back on their, on their career and goes, I, I loved all those meetings. And the, the, the heart of that is the meeting isn't the work. A meeting is a moment on which we report on work and set new work. And the danger of all of uh, of, of all white collar organisations and white collar ways of living is that the meeting becomes the work. The meeting is a channel. Uh, the meeting is a possibility. The meeting is a potential, but the meeting isn't the work. Um, and the just as the petition isn't the work, I think somebody mentioned petitions before. The 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 the, the petition is evidence, um, but the work is the outcome, and the outcome is the impact. The outcome is not in what you said. It's not the increased funding. It's the funding being spent in a program, spent in a way that's the right way that has the right that achieves the outcome, the purpose of the spending. Because again. You know, they say we say we say in the UK, and I bet it's true in New Zealand. You know, min ministers think that something is achieved when they announce it in a speech, and civil servants think something's been achieved when they send out a circular about it. And actually, the thing, the change hasn't happened until it's actually. <laughs> so um, it's good to have the access, um, and it's good to be uh, to have to 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 be part of the constant conversation, which I think really is what, uh, in the end, beginning and end of what I'm saying is, um, is a relationship is always being developed when you have coffee with people, when you petition people, when you take photographs with them, but it's, but it is, relationships are for a purpose. I remember being frustrated um, when I was in defense, uh, whenever you have meetings with the foreign office, they, they go, you can't do that. And they say, why? And you say, well, we want to maintain our relationship with such and such. And you finally go, do we never cash our relationships? Do we just always build up chips in our relationships and we never kind of, so we never go, you can't do that. You mustn't do that. That is, so go to my own mind. You know, <clears throat> you're always too busy maintaining relationships to actually act. It's that they were, it's, you know, sometimes 
we just have to go, yeah, that's brilliant. Sometimes we go, that could be better. Sometimes we go, that is wrong because we've all, none of us who have relationships uh, with partners or relationships with family or relationships with friends, there's no, but none of our friends, family or uh, partners are always right or always wrong. Now I'm always right, obviously, because you've, you've listened to me for an hour and a half and I'm always, but like we, we, if we're going to have long sustainable relationships, those are going to be adult mature relationships in which actually sometimes we're wrong. Sometimes we're too noisy. Um, and we have to accept that too. And sometimes we're wrong because of our, the coalitions and our stakeholders sometimes are wrong because we actually called it wrong. Uh, and we have to have the ability to reflect on our own, on, on our own, uh, our own actions and, and think about that, that we made the wrong call. Um, maybe never say it to anybody, but actually that's self-reflection. So in a healthy relationship is challenging. And we have to maintain that element of challenge to each other in these kinds of forums uh in the meetings that you were talking about having well look thank you thank you for having me i've kept some of you a bit longer than you probably expected to or wanted to but um i can talk i can i can talk for a long time um, <laughs> oh john thank you so much um for, for those of you who've ever watched the thick of it or in the loop um the character of malcolm tucker is an amalgamation of john <laughs> and uh, Alistair Campbell. So um, it has been very well behaved. You've been very well behaved, John. Um, now, I really appreciate that. I know that our sector does. You've had a number of CEOs. You've had MFAT staff. You've had um, staff from our organizations, uh, yeah. colleagues from across the ditch in Australia, Pacific. Um, so I think the one thing we, we will try and kind of consolidate some of the stuff that you've said and the lessons learned. But I think the takeaway really is, you know, one pebble can change the direction of the stream. Um, and the edge crunch lift, and anyone who knows me, I go on and on about this all the time. Edge, the, the cut through crunch, the specificity, the granularity, is it a tune that, that someone's gonna remember in their head? And lift, so important, that sense of aspiration of lifting people up um, and bringing people with you and making people excited. So that actually is the framework for every meeting with the minister, Pauline, mm -hmm every campaign, every conversation with one or two people or thousands. Um, so John, um, thank you, bless you for sharing your expertise and, and skills. No and we look forward to seeing you in New Zealand. We'll, we'll make, yep. make even more of you. And if you wanna hang yeah. around while people um, head off, but thanks everyone for, for joining as well and for sticking around for an hour and a half. So great to have so many people here. Thanks John. Bye.